Chapter 7 Intruders I fear no man. But that thing, it scares me. The heavy, team fortress too. UA high school the next day. And he just, left. Shoto Todoroki questioned. Izuka nodded along with his friends. He and the others had just finished telling him of their first-hand account of watching the armored vigilante mutilate the leader of the League of Villains. Since Shoto and Bakuga did not attend the outing due to personal reasons, they heard what happened on the news and were now being told by their friends who gathered in a large group about what had transpired. The only ones who weren't a part of the group were Katsuki Bakugu and Achiko Yurarika who sat at their desks. Shoto's expression was troubled. The way they described the man's brutal treatment of Tamura Shigaraki was unnerving but the part where he tore the villain's arm off and beat him half to death with it disturbed him significantly. Something like this was unheard of in hero society. Tamura may be a villain but that man went too far. Shoto shook his head as he looked at his feet. Exactly. Tenya exclaimed dramatically, doing odd motions with his arms. Heroes must always set an example to inspire hope and safety to the public, not engage in wanton brutality. What that man did was, was. Beyond fucked up. Mina Ashido finished for him. Language, Mina. Tenya shouted as he pointed at her. Also, yes. I'm just glad we didn't try to take that guy head on. Siro Hanta said. I know he pulled us out of the fire but I wouldn't want to get in his way. You should be lucky you didn't. Fumikage sternly told him as the others looked at him. When I first saw him I felt dark shadow panic and fear. I never felt it so terrified in my life. It was begging me to run and not to face that man. Whoever or whatever that vigilante was, getting in his way would mean certain death. And coming from me, that's saying a lot. Everyone felt a collective chill run up their spine. Izuku now realized why Fumikage stopped him from chasing after the vigilante. A cloud of silence hung in the air as the students let Tokoyami's tail sink in. You fucking pussies. That insult came from the classroom's resident glory hound slash total asshole, Bakugu. I can't believe you extras let that green bastard get away. I woulda gone after him and take him down myself since none of you have any fucking balls. Maybe you didn't hear us the first time, man. He tore the guy's arm off. My netta hollered. So much blood. Yuga Aoyama shuddered as he hugged himself, his whole body shaking like a leaf. I mean, what chance would a bunch of first years like us have against a guy like him? We'd be ripped apart. Denki Kaminari added, trying to talk some sense into Bakugu. And that's not even counting the massive guns he had on him. Well, at least Round Face fought the other villain who showed up. Bakugu rolled his eyes as he jabbed a thumb over to Urarika at the other end of the room. The girl said nothing, keeping her eyes glued to her desk. She had a vacant, frightened look on her face and her eyes would dart around at certain intervals. Yo, round face. You and Erodash, Bakugu called out to her before he saw Kyokajiro shake her head and draw a line across her throat. Letting out an agitated scoff, Bakugu turned his head away and looked out the window. Kyoka turned to Urarika and frowned worriedly. Her friend had been like this ever since this morning. She was beginning to wonder if Urarika had some kind of PTSD from yesterday. Midoriya saw it as well, he wanted to try and talk with her but felt that maybe he and the others should give her some space for a while. This other villain you mentioned. You said he had the same powers as mine. Shoto questioned. Yeah but only your flame quirk and they were colored blue. I think the flames might have been hotter than yours. Koji Kota communicated through sign language. Todoroki felt very troubled by the news. Sure there were different variations of fire-based quirks but this one sounded all too familiar to his. It could have been a mere coincidence but what if it wasn't? Nah, it couldn't be. He was overthinking things as usual. He focused back on the matter of the vigilante and turned to Izuku. You said before that the vigilante pulled weapons out of thin air. Yeah. I think he might have some kind of quirk that allows him to do that. Midoriya figured. Though I can't think of any quirk I've heard or read about that does that. Maybe it's a new type of quirk that's never been discovered before. 
I mean, there's always new quirks being discovered every day in Tori's dash. Dude, you're mumbling again. Rikido Sato sweat dropped, causing Izuku to stop his ramblings and look embarrassed. What do you guys think the pro heroes are going to do about him? They should arrest him. It's too dangerous to let someone like him run around Nuzurafu. Mizo Shoji said, folding his multiple arms. That and being a vigilante is technically illegal. Yeah. And has that guy ever had his head checked? He's like Gears of War and Jason Voorhees all rolled into one. Toru Hagakure exclaimed as she wildly flailed her arms around, not that you could see them since she was invisible. Mashireo Ojiro nodded in agreement as his large tail swished around. He remembered something about the vigilante his classmate mentioned earlier. Hey, didn't you say that you saw this guy a couple of days ago, Isuku? Yeah. He just fell out of the sky right outside my apartment and walked off when my mom and I tried to help him. We thought he was a hero on patrol but something still seemed odd about him. Izuku explained. So you let a six feet tall psycho walk free. You really dropped the fucking ball, Deku. Bakugu barked indignantly. Now hold on. Momo Yayorozu intervened, coming to Midoriya's defense. There was no way Izuku could have known that guy wasn't a hero. She's right. If anything, we would have ended up doing the same thing if we were all placed in Midoriya's situation. Tsuyu Azui reasoned, causing Bakugu to scowl and look away again. Nobody knows any real way to visually differentiate between a hero and a vigilante, at least until now. As everyone else began offering their views and opinions, Izuku was left to his thoughts. What should he have done differently back then? If he knew that man was incredibly dangerous, should he have tried to stop him when they first met? So many what-ifs and alternate outcomes were swirling around within his mind as Izuku began to chillingly realize that not reporting the vigilante was all on him. Hey, you okay, buddy? Kirishima tapped Izuku's shoulder, startling him a bit. You look pretty down. I, I don't know. Izuku started before he looked down at his feet. I can't help but feel that this is my fault. Your fault? Dude, none of this is your fault. You didn't know, simple as that. I'm sure the pro heroes will nab his crazy ass eventually. Besides, I doubt he's gonna go another rampage. Beneath Musuda for the Slayer's hideout. Eight hours later. Dusting off his hands, the Slayer chucked the last of the dismantled motorcycles into a pile at the other end of the station. He spent another sleepless night making his new home more habitable which consisted of burying the bones of the biker gang and getting rid of the ugly motorcycles they had. This left only one motorcycle that thankfully hadn't been turned into a clown bike, an old American chopper that the gang had probably purchased from overseas. He had stored the old weapons in the storage room of the subway car, as much as he wanted to try them out, they were too rusted due to years of disuse. He had already become acclimated with the weapons he picked up during his time on the alternate Mars and he wasn't going to ditch them anytime soon. But now that he thought about it, there was one problem he faced in this new universe, ammo. Despite snagging a staggering overabundance of ammo during his excursion on the alternate Mars and hell, enough to keep him supplied for at least several months, he knew it wouldn't last forever. Acquiring shotgun shells and 50 caliber ammunition should be relatively easy and fuel for his chainsaw wasn't a problem either. He could easily swipe a few cans of gasoline at a gas station. But his rockets were specially designed by the UAC which meant that other rocket types would be incompatible with his rocket launcher. And then of course there were plasma cells and BFG cells. He heavily doubted that this universe was able to manufacture plasma in a way used for weapons and no Argent energy meant that he only had two cells left for his BFG, having used one shot to finish off the spider mastermind. His UAC grenades and hologram projectors were another problem as well, never bothered to pick up those useless siphon grenades back on the alternate Mars. As he mulled his predicament over, he sat himself down on one of the old benches in the station. He felt like he had no real purpose in this world, no clear goal. What was left for him if there weren't any demons to kill? Could he call himself a doomslayer anymore? Slash slayer, I am picking up 40 heat signatures approaching our position. From the entrance, forward slash. 
He snapped his head up towards the partially boarded up entryway to the station and could easily hear the sounds of footsteps, many footsteps, getting closer. Almost immediately he bolted out of his seat, hopped down onto the tracks the subway train was on, and ducked into the subway tunnel ahead of it. With the darkness of the tunnel concealing his presence, the slayer peered out from the corner a little and gritted his teeth in annoyance. He knew it would already be a matter of time before the heroes of this world would come looking for him and take him into custody. He wasn't going to jail and he was not going to lie down and do nothing. He was, for all intents and purposes, a monster but he was not a murderer. As soon as the heroes entered the station, he would rush in, incapacitate them all before leaving the station and find someplace else in Japan to lay low. Slash scanning, none of them are quirk users, forward slash. Fuck. They were probably cops. Now he really had to hold himself back. The footsteps were starting to get louder and he could easily make out several silhouettes nearing the entrance. He balled up his fists and prepared for a brief altercation, and saw these men weren't police officers in the slightest. Stepping into the station and descending the stairs were multiple men dressed in pitch black military garb, all of them outfitted with Kevlar vests, ammo bandoliers, armored plates around the joints, and gas masks that covered their faces along with black hoods. They were also outfitted with impressive, state of the art weaponry. FNP-90 submachine guns, ARX-160 assault rifles, USAS-12 fully automatic shotguns, and MG-4 light machine guns. As the last of the soldiers entered the station they began to skin the area with their weapons at the ready. The Doomslayer, ever silent, watched them with great interest. Who were these guys? After a few tense minutes of scanning and searching the station, one of the men with several yellow stripes around the sleeve of his uniform twirled his finger in the air and the other soldiers regrouped over to him. One of the soldiers handed a subway map he procured from the subway car to the apparent commanding officer and the CO silently studied it. He held up his hand, signaling his regiment to be at ease. He then pressed his finger up against the tactical headset near his ear. Commander 9, this is Theta Squad 12. We've located an old subway station several miles beneath the city. I can confirm that this'll make the perfect fallback point after we're done with the operation. Good work, Sergeant. Is the station occupied by any chance? There's a functioning generator here that looks like it was used recently. Could be a couple of hobos. Scare, am off. Negative, I want no witnesses. We've just rendezvoused with Wolfram's team and we are commencing the operation on Eye Island now. Once we have everything locked down, Lieutenant Chimera will contact your squad and you will relay the coordinates for the fallback point. Unload the supplies and secure the station while we proceed on schedule. Understood, Commander. Theta Squad 12, out. The Doomslayer absorbed this information as the soldiers began to fan out and went back up the steps to retrieve the supplies. It sounded like something big was going down but what was this eye island they were talking about? Several men began bringing down multiple black cases that were as big as a couch. They started unpacking them to reveal portable generators like the Slayer had but much more technologically advanced. Some of them revealed ammo and more weapons while the last of the cases unfolded into a large, portable computer. One other thing the Slayer took note of was the insignia of a silver-colored saber-toothed tiger emblazoned upon the cases. Slash I am hacking their terminal now, forward slash. The soldier who unpacked the computer turned to his right to unpack another container but never noticed Vega's logo flashing on the computer screen and by the time he turned back, it had vanished before he could even notice. Slash hack complete. These men are part of a highly dangerous army of mercenaries known as the Steel Sabres. Their origins can be traced back to South Africa after the apartheid though as time went on, they evolved into a multinational outfit, forward slash. The Doomslayers had began to show him various pictures of the mercenaries' rise to power and infamy, black and white photos of the Sabres participating in numerous military theaters around the world and soon changing into clearer, colorized pictures of the men in present-day uniforms and armed with better weaponry. Slash the Sabres of today are being led by four very powerful quirk users, one of which is their leader, forward slash. His HUD showed him portraits of the said individuals and their info. The first mugshot was the leader of the Steel Sabres, a man codenamed Nine. 
He was a white-haired man with eyes that lacked any emotion or empathy and wore a black bodysuit with blue highlights and several cylindrical tanks sticking out of his back. He had a weather manipulation quirk that gave him power over lightning, wind, and ice but the power took a toll on his body, hence the need for the suit. Then came his lieutenants. The first was a woman codenamed Slice. She had vibrant orange hair that looped down to her midsection and wore a purple blouse with a black domino mask. Her quirk allowed her to move, sharpen, and harden her hair into blade-like weapons. The second was a man with gray hair, and orange eyes wrapped nearly head to toe in burgundy-colored bandages along with a combat vest and a small sword slung around his shoulder. His codename was Mummy, a reference to his quirk that let him control inanimate objects via his bandages. The final lieutenant was an interesting one, to say the least. He was not a man but rather an anthropomorphic wolf with blue and white for wearing a tan trench coat and hair done up in dreadlocks. Chimera was his codename and was again based on his quirk, it granted him the capability to undertake the characteristics of various animals. Slash the Steel Sabres are widely regarded across the world as the most proficient and deadliest mercenary group in existence. They are expertly trained, heavily armed with the latest weapons and technology, and have killed over 246 heroes, forward slash. What? Vega showed him a slideshow of the Steel Sabres victims, the images were a grisly sight to behold. Each photo showed heroes of all shapes and sizes dead with over a dozen gunshot wounds. Some were decapitated, had bullet holes in the sides of their heads, sliced apart, burned to death, or blown up with explosives. Some corpses were desecrated, stripped of their costumes, scalped, or hung from their necks. Most disturbing of all was that some of these heroes were very young, most of them barely out of their teens. The last picture showed the present-day Sabres, along with their leader Nine and his lieutenants, standing near a shot-up wall in some war-torn country with 18 dead heroes all lined up in a row against each other. Some of the soldiers, as well as Chimera and Slice, were smiling or posing while crouched down like hunters who just bagged a moose. The Doomslayer felt his rage reach its boiling point as his fists shook violently. His mind once again flashed back to all of those comic books he read when he was a kid. He loved reading about superheroes and his heart would leap with joy when they beat the bad guy in the end. Seeing these heroes be slaughtered like animals, these fuckers were no better than the horrors he fought for eons. They had to die. He overheard the CO order some men to skin the tunnels and slowly stepped away, disappearing into the darkness. The two soldiers entered the dark tunnel and slowly walked through it, the flashlights mounted on their weapons illuminating their way through the darkness. After a few minutes, they came upon a large cave-in, blocking off their route. One of them pressed a button on the radio attached to his wrist. This is Crow and Vejboski, all clear. The Merc nodded to his partner and the two of them began to head back to the subway tunnel entrance, unaware of the large shape silently advancing towards them from behind. Meanwhile, Sergeant Burke oversaw the rest of the troopers finishing up with their assigned tasks. He went over to the ones working on the generators as they hooked up the wires to the smaller power supply boxes along the wall. How are we looking? Generators are primed and ready, Sergeant. Just needs a few moments to power up and we're good to go, that'll be enough to power the whole subway system. Good. Communications. Fully operational, sir. Servers are set up and ready to receive any incoming messages from my island. The sergeant checked his watch and smiled. Ten minutes ahead of schedule. The mercenary sent to scout out the tunnels came back and saluted Burke. Sergeant, we finished our recon of the tunnels. One of them is blocked off but the two tunnels down at the end are clear and they'll provide a route for Commander Nine and the rest of the Steel Sabres to navigate through to us. Excellent work. I can see a big promotion in our future weight. Where's Crow and Vejboski? Sergeant Burke noticed. Everyone began looking towards the tunnel the two previously went in. They reported this tunnel was sealed up and secured but they never returned. Vejboski, Crow. What's the holdup? One soldier spoke into the radio. Nothing responded, they could only hear static. Guys. You there. Where are you? The sergeant was getting impatient and turned on his radio. Vejboski, 
Stop dicking around and bring Crow and Eurus back here now. If this is your attempt at humor, so help me F-U-C-K. Two objects were tossed at Burke's feet and when he and the other sabers looked down, they recoiled in horror when they saw that it was the severed heads of Crow and Vejboski. As the soldiers staggered away in fright, the Doomslayer darted out of the tunnel along the tracks as he ran to the old generator and shut it off. The entire subway station was plunged into darkness and the mercs began to arm themselves with their weapons. Safety's off, we've got a hostel in the area. Switch to night vision. The sergeant ordered as the sounds of weapons being cocked were heard. One by one the soldiers pressed a button on the side of their gas masks to activate the night vision function. The last of the soldiers activated his mask. Doom 2016 Flesh and Metal Just in time to see a man covered in green armor, armed with a chainsaw, barrel straight towards him out of the darkness. His head was sawed off in one swing, shouts of panic filled the air as the headless body crumpled to the floor, blood splashing against some of the mercs present. Contact. Hostile sighted. Drop him. Every weapon that was in the hands of the soldiers roared to life as they opened fire upon the armored man. Now normally, any man would be easily ripped asunder by the amount of armor-piercing ammunition and shotgun rounds being fired at him and no amount of Kevlar could protect anybody from such an onslaught. But the Slayer's armor was forged by a rouge demon within the fires of hell and then later enhanced with UAC technology after they dug him up. The Praetor suit was designed to withstand anything hell could throw at the Doom Slayer. But against regular firearms. All of those bullets and pellets were shattering like glass against his armor. The Doom Slayer descended upon the mercenaries without mercy, intent on making them pay for every hero they killed. Every swing of his chainsaw cleaved through them with no resistance whatsoever as any merc caught in his path was decapitated, bisected, and bifurcated. He hacked off the hands of one mercenary and followed up with a quick decapitation before slamming his elbow into the face of another merc, enough to make his head snap back with an audible crunch. He pulled out his double-barreled shotgun and fired into the group, taking out several of them while two were instantly blown in half. He reloaded and blew the head off of another merc while grabbing one by the neck and crushing his windpipe. He threw the body at another merc and while he was struggling to rise, the slayer ran over and punted his head off like a football before spinning around and slamming both of his hands on another soldier's face, crushing his skull like it was stuck in a hydraulic press. He revved up the chainsaw again and sawed another hapless merc diagonally. He's not going down. He's not fucking going down. The slayer put away his weapons and began to tear the mercs apart with his bare hands. Each haymaker broke their necks, each uppercut decapitated them, each headbutt caved their skulls in and each punch to the gut caused their organs to rupture or outright explode. The slayer grabbed the face of one merc and slammed him right into a column, crushing his skull like a soggy pumpkin. A saber ran up to him and unloaded his light machine gun point blank into the side of the slayer's head. But that didn't do shit either and the Doomslayer grabbed the barrel of the weapon, bent it at a 90 degree angle, and swung his leg up hard enough to shave off the mercenary's face and lower jaw right off his head. Another merc charged in while unloading his automatic shotgun on him but the Slayer swiped the weapon out of his hands and impaled him with it. He rushed towards another saber and ripped him in half, launching himself at another one with his chainsaw drawn out and sawing him up the middle. While all of this was happening, the soldiers of fortune kept firing at the Doomslayer and were rapidly losing their minds at the sight of an implacable berserker who was tearing his way through their ranks. What the fuck is his armor made of? He's taken out half the squad. Die, motherfucker. The mercenaries continued to open fire while some threw their grenades at him. The grenades exploded at his feet but these grenades were substantially weaker than his UAC brand grenades which had a bigger blast radius and more powerful explosion so those did next to nothing against his armor, let alone make him stagger. He stored his chainsaw away and whipped out his plasma gun outfitted with the stun bomb mod and fired a bomb right at them, creating a burst of Birkeland currents that fatally electrocuted the mercenaries, frying their nerves and causing most of their eyeballs to boil and explode. Drawing his HAR with his free hand he unleashed a hail of death from both guns as the 50 caliber rounds and plasma bolts shredded through the soldiers of fortunes like they were made of tissue paper. Putting away the plasma gun, the slayer finished off the stragglers by firing a stream of mini-missiles at them which embedded themselves into their bodies before violently exploding. Soon all was quiet in the station as the doomslayer put away his HAR. 
Then he heard a humming sound from one of the generators the Sabres had set up and the subway station was lit up once again. The carnage was all laid out for the Slayer to see, nearly the whole station was covered in red, bodies, severed limbs, bullet casings, craters, and entrails. He heard a groan to his right and noticed a wounded merc on the ground trying to reach for his weapon only for the Slayer to promptly whip out his sawed off and blasted him right then and there. The sound of a large weapon being loaded could be heard behind him and the Doomslayer turned around to see the sergeant propped up against one of the cases missing an arm and a chunk of his leg aiming a Danel PAW-20 grenade launcher aimed right at him. Burke pulled the trigger and a high explosive grenade launched out of the barrel and hit the Slayer dead on. A dense explosion enveloped him and obscured most of the station in the dust. Burke smiled deliriously for a moment but his victory was astoundingly cut short when the smoke cleared to reveal the armored butcher was completely unharmed. The Doomslayer simply wiped away the dust on his chest plate and began stomping towards the sergeant who had a look of open mouth horror. Fuck me. 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 Burke screamed over and over again as he wildly fired at the Slayer with his launcher but the indomitable superhuman still kept walking towards him while tanking every shell that exploded against his Praetor suit. The Doomslayer finally closed the distance, swatted the weapon out of the sergeant's hand, and put his fist straight through his face. Removing his fist from the now-dead mercenary, the Slayer looked at his handiwork. He felt a small bit of satisfaction for avenging all those heroes that were slain by these men but he knew that there were more of them that needed to pay. And that meant going after their leader, Nine. Slash these mercenaries were previously discussing an operation currently in progress. I am accessing their terminal to acquire more intel, forward slash. Now that Vega mentioned it, they did talk about an island of sorts. The Slayer walked over to the terminal, which was thankfully undamaged during the chaotic firefight, and seated himself on the floor while Vega worked his magic. Slash I have analyzed their current whereabouts. The Steel Sabres are enacting a massive scale invasion of a seafaring research base known as I Island. It is the most technologically advanced artificial island in the world, housing thousands of scientists and guarded by state of the art security systems. The primary purpose of this facility is the creation of specialized support items for heroes and scientific study of the quirk phenomenon. It also hosts an expo to showcase said technologies. Forward slash. The Doomslayer absorbed this information and thought it over. While it sounded like this place had benevolent intentions, it still had the potential to become another UAC. But that didn't mean he was going to blow the whole place up at this present time. All that mattered was finding out why the Steel Sabres wanted to ransack this place. Obviously for the Tech I Island housed but what if there was something more? Slash the Steel Sabres had enlisted all 9,870 members for this endeavor, it is their entire organization. What they intend to do and what they are after are not listed on their servers but I have found evidence that suggests they are in a joint operation with representatives from the League of Villains, forward slash. The Slayer clenched his fists. Somehow he knew he wouldn't hear the last of that organization and the dried up little hobgoblin running it. If they had joined up with a notorious team of mercenaries, then it couldn't be good. Slash right now as we speak, they have already infiltrated the whole island and taken hostages. The Sabres have also hacked the security system and have captured several pro heroes visiting from overseas, as well as All Might himself and civilians. The Japanese government and pro heroes are unable to approach the island due to the volatile hostage situation. This is a national crisis, forward slash. The Slayer tapped his finger on his knee, this was a very dire situation, no doubt about it. But what surprised him was how these guys were able to capture the symbol of peace. If something wasn't done, then all of those heroes and maybe even all might be next on the Steel Sabre's chopping block. It would be more trophies for their gruesome tally. Slash there is no other way for the pro heroes to approach the situation due to their non-violent methods and code of honor but we may be sufficient enough to resolve the situation and eliminate a threat to heroes worldwide. I also have reason to believe that I Island may have inventions that could benefit us. I will leave the decision up to you and have mapped out the quickest route topside to the nearest port, forward slash. The Doomslayer didn't need to be told twice. He shut off the generator so the lights wouldn't give away his hideout and went to the left subway tunnel. Stepping down onto the tracks, he crouched down a little and suddenly broke into a sprint, 
running through the tunnels as he followed his waypoint on his HUD. The Slayer had his mind focused on storming Eye Island, partially to save the heroes, make the Saber suffer, and upgrade his gear. Nine probably prided himself and his crew to be the best of the best. They obviously hadn't met him yet. To be continued. Chapter 8. Mad Dash. Musuda Femina Ashido Residence. Hardcore News. We don't just bring you the latest news, you bring you the most intense news on the planet. Greetings, fellow viewers. Tony Pope, live with Hardcore. On the scene and in your face. It's a hostage situation that looks like it was ripped straight out of Die Hard. Cops everywhere, reporters ambling about, the lives of dozens of innocents on the line as the world's most infamous mercenaries have turned Eye Island into a literal Nakatomi Plaza. Can the heroes and authorities stop the steel sabers? Ah. They're outmanned, outgunned, and incompetent. Prime Minister of Japan. What are you doing? The symbol of peace has a gun to his head. Get off your ass and declare martial law. Mina pressed the mute button, turning off the reporter's tirade. After they decided who was going to Eye Island via rock, paper, scissors, the girls decided to have a sleepover to soften the blow of being unable to visit the Eye Island Expo with their classmates. So far the sleepover had been a blast but that's when they heard on the TV that there was an apparent terrorist attack on Eye Island. They switched to a news station to get more info but were greeted by a man who acted like he had won too many cups of coffee. Americans. Mina shook her head disapprovingly as she watched Tony continue with his rant. They always exaggerate. How the heck did they let someone like him into this country? Hagakure wondered. Try switching to MNN. That's usually a reliable source. Tsuyu suggested. Mina flipped through a couple of channels until she found the right one. Port of Tokyo JSSDF Blockade. This is correspondent Megumi Shindo of Musurafu News Network. For those of you who are just joining us, we are live on the scene at Tokyo Harbor where the JSDF, local police officers, and pro heroes have cordoned off the area. Behind me, you can see Eye Island out in the distance where earlier this evening, an army of mercenaries known worldwide as the Steel Sabres infiltrated Eye Island and have taken the island's population hostage, including several pro heroes from other countries and All Might himself. We have reason to believe that they have taken full control of the security system, widely believed to be on par with Tartarus Prison. Though an SOS was sent out, it did little good as the mercenaries now have a solid foothold on Eye Island and has become a floating fortress. They have offered no demands but have warned all not to come anywhere near Eye Island or they will execute the hostages, including the heroes and potentially All Might. No attempts have been made to breach Eye Island and the pro heroes cannot risk mass fatalities in what has been called by many to be the most volatile hostage crisis of the century. The Steel Sabres are a name that strikes fear into the hearts of many heroes and with the symbol of peace at their mercy, it seems that his life and the lives of the other heroes and civilians on the island are now in God's hands. The correspondent finished her report just as the police politely requested her to move back from the barricade for her safety. The entire area, as well as the entrance to the docks, was swarming with cops and soldiers. Many were keeping the concerned bystanders at bay while setting up long-range counter-surveillance equipment to try and hack into Eye Island security systems and maybe give them a chance to turn things around but it was no use. It would take months to override the systems, the Steel Sabres were able to do it in just a few hours. The Japanese government issued a strict no-fly order anywhere near Eye Island as well as forbidding any boat from approaching it. The whole situation was a powder keg waiting to explode and the slightest misstep could result in incalculable losses. All they could do for now was sit tight and hope that the mercenaries would get what they wanted and spare all might. But even then, that was just wishful thinking. Sewer system beneath the port of Tokyo. The waypoint on his HUD had led the slayer behind the designated JSDF barricade and to a manhole cover above him. He was just about to climb up the ladder when Vega contacted him. Slash there are currently no forms of transportation that will get you to Eye Island without alerting the Steel Sabres. But I have a solution, your Delta V jump boots can be reconfigured to fire a continuous stream of propulsion rather than a short burst at the apex of your jump. These adjustments can allow you to easily traverse through the water to Eye Island since your Praetor suit lacks any form of buoyancy, forward slash. 
The Doomslayer looked at his arm, noting that he would probably sink like a rock if he ever jumped into a deep body of water. He leaned against the wall and popped off his jump boots. He started fiddling with the knobs near the ankles of the boots until he had the right settings configured and slipped them back onto his feet. Slash be aware that multiple pro heroes are in the current vicinity. I hope you do not plan on fatally dash forward slash. The slayer shook his head and held up his hand as a gesture of reassurance. True to convictions, he was not going to kill any heroes. Slash that is most comforting. I will leave how you handle them up to your discretion and will contact you again once you are in proximity to the island, forward slash. Looking back up at the manhole, the slayer was beginning to notice something about Vega. As time went on, the AI was starting to act more, human. Using words like hope and comforting were signs that the Vega truly was evolving into something more. But the doomslayer was not at all perturbed by this observation, he rather encouraged it. How could he ever turn his back on someone who helped him so much back on the alternate Mars? The Slayer began to climb up the ladder, ready to show the heroes and villains of this world how justice was served on Argentner. Port of Tokyo Warehouse District several minutes earlier. Standing atop one of the cranes at the harbor, Hawks and Loud Cloud gazed silently at Eye Island in the distance. They couldn't muster the will to remain confident and upbeat like they usually did. And how could they? The most dangerous mercenaries on the planet had captured the symbol of peace and the most technologically advanced facility in the world. It was a pretty big deal for every pro hero and sidekick called out here and they weren't taking it well. Hawks looked up at the starry night sky with the moon high above. Letting out a sigh, the number six pro hero leaped off the crane and flew back down to the ground while Loud Cloud followed him atop one of his floating clouds. The two of them glided down towards one of the three large teams of pro heroes patrolling the district. The one they were currently a part of consisted of Present Mike, Midnight, Eraser Head, Endeavor, Gang Orca, Selkie, Miruko, Fatcom, Gran Torino, Crust, Ryukyu, Sliden, Go, and Mr. Brave. The overall mood was extremely tense, you could feel it in the air. Anything? Mr. Brave asked. All quiet. Just be grateful we haven't heard any gunshots yet. Hawks answered as he looked back to Eye Island. Are you guys sure there isn't any way for you to get closer? Ryukyu pressed worriedly. No can do. Loud Cloud shook his head as he waved a finger at her. You heard what the JSDF said, no copters or flight-based quirks. We can't risk the sabers spotting us, they might end up executing a hostage or a hero. Maybe we can try to get inside from underwater. Selkie suggested to Gang Orca. That way we could sneak in and rescue the hostages. We could get the drop on them dash. It's a good idea but don't forget that these aren't the usual thugs or overconfident villains we face on a regular basis. These are highly trained soldiers of fortune. Gang Orca lectured. They fought heroes like us before on numerous occasions and for all we know, they probably have scanning equipment that'll see us coming from a mile away. And even if they didn't, it's just too great of a risk. So basically, we're blind, deaf, and dumb over here. Miruko impatiently threw up her arms. We don't have a choice. Eraser head tiredly sighed. We can't rush in completely half-cocked and get people killed. This is ridiculous. Endeavor bellowed as his flaming beard grew in intensity. If we let these reprobates dig in any further, we'll have to level the whole damn island to flush them out. They're already dug in, Endeavor. That entire island's been turned into Fort Knox. Gran Torino rebuked the flame hero gruffly. We'll just have to wait until they get what they want. But how do we know they're not going to kill the hostages, the heroes, and All Might afterward? We have to do something. Mr. Brave proclaimed. Cool your jets, bud. All Might's been in tougher scrapes than this. I guarantee you that he'll bust out and handle this in no time flat. Present Mike reassured him with a pat on the back. I mean, come on. You guys think a bunch of mercs can hold him. It'll certainly be a grim day for us all if he lost to such a measly foe. Endeavor huffed. Yeah, right. I bet that's something you're hoping for. Miruko fiercely shot back. 
Endeavor visibly seethed as he glared daggers at the rabbit heroine. It was no secret that the two pro-heroes were not on friendly terms. Endeavor viewed Maruko as a troublesome, rebellious upstart who didn't deserve the number five spot while Maruko saw Endeavor as a self-centered, uncaring blowhard who became a hero just so he could be number one. Midnight quickly stepped in to extinguish the flames of rivalry between them. Calm down, you two. This isn't the time or place for this. Midnight scolded. Maruko and Endeavor gave each other the stink eye one last time before huffing and looking away. If we stay focused and keep a cool head, we can get through this. It's not any different from hostage situations we've dealt with in the past. Ah, I don't mean to be a downer here but those are the steel sabers we're talking about here. Fatgum reminded them. Midnight's confidence faltered, as did everyone else's. For decades, ever since the rise of heroes, the Steel Sabres had become something of a boogeyman-like presence amongst the pro-heroes worldwide. They knew just how dangerous these mercenaries are and there was no limit to how skilled they were. But then there were the numerous pro-heroes who fell to these ruthless soldiers, the body count for each one they killed seemed to rise every year. There was no way they could erase the grisly photos that showed brave men and women of heroism that were horribly butchered by the Steel Sabres from their minds. They were feared for a good reason and even All Might himself was wary of them. And now they were here in Japan, and they had hundreds of hostages, pro-heroes from overseas, and the symbol of peace completely at their mercy. I didn't think they were real. But that's when I heard the stories about them. Crust admitted as he looked down at the ground. The battles they participated in, the war crimes they committed, all the... His lips quivered as he balled up a fist while tears started to leak from his eyes. All the heroes they killed. A cold silence hung over the group. 246 heroes, taken from this world way too soon, showed so much promise at a young age or right in the middle of their prime. Gran Torino frowned sadly, many of those heroes were his comrades and Nana Shimura's closest friends. To think that they could be felled by simple, quirkless soldiers was unheard of but certainly not on this scale. Eraser had turned to look at Eye Island out in the distance. His students were there. Dread filled his heart, his mind conjuring up images of their bullet-ridden bodies and him attending their funerals. He tried to get them out of his head but he couldn't, it was like he was looking at the inevitable. How could he ever call himself their teacher if he wasn't able to save them? Loud Cloud placed a hand on Eraser Head's shoulder in reassurance. He, along with Present Mike and Midnight, knew what their closest friend was going through. Oboro couldn't think up anything that could soothe his friend's distress. For a while, nobody said anything as the gravity of the situation started to bear down upon them. Okay, okay, okay. That's enough sad times. Someone said loudly followed by the sound of clapping hands. It was Slight and Go, the slippery hero. When a villain with a magma quirk went on a rampage in Esoha City, did we throw in the towel? When a hurricane decimated eastern Japan, did we run home crying? When a bunch of inmates broke out of Tartarus prison, did we say uncle? Nay. We stuck to our guns, stood our ground and we charged into the fire like real heroes. We didn't give up then and we certainly aren't going to give up now. The pro heroes present, sans endeavor who thought Slyden, Go was being melodramatic, perked up a little after that rousing speech. A perpetual smiler he may be he knew how to rally a crowd with his boundless optimism. This was not the time to be moping around, this was the time to be heroes. This may look dire but if past experiences have proved anything, we always prevail in the end. Slyden, Go continued bombastically. Mark my words, we'll come up with a plan to put an end to this sticky situation and. Slyden, Go trailed off when he noticed something in the distance. Say, who's that? Everyone looked over to their left to see a figure far away from them standing in the middle of the road near some shipping containers. The Doomslayer's objective was at the end of the docks, where he could jump off the pier and swim all the way to Eye Island. He was fully aware of the pro heroes near his position but he didn't care. So long as they stayed out of his way there wouldn't be any problems. Vega had already analyzed them and informed him of their quirks, it was nothing he couldn't handle. 
Ryukyu squinted her eyes at the man encased in armor and recognized him as the vigilante the Hero Public Safety Commission and the Musidofa Police Force had put out an advisory for, as well as the same one Maruko and Fatgum encountered a day ago and told the other pro heroes about. That's Dash. Doom 2016 break them. In that instant, the Doomslayer bolted like an Olympic track runner out of view. Where is he Dash? Stop him. Don't let him get away. The pro heroes quickly gave chase after the vigilante, with Slyden go taking the lead due to his friction quirk. The purple costumed hero skated around the shipping containers like he was wearing invisible rollerblades until he came into view of the armor clad man, his heavy footsteps echoing across the port. Slyden go easily closed the distance and leaped up at the vigilante, catching him in a headlock while he continued to run. Sir, you are interfering in an official hero operation and endangering hostages. Slyden go yelled at the vigilante as the pro-hero tightened his hold on him. I am demanding that you stand down immediately or I will be forced to huh. Slyden go looked at the vigilante's hand and his eyes nearly popped out of his skull when he saw the grenade in his grasp, he had already pulled the pin. Ayakak. Slyden go shrieked as he dislodged himself from the vigilante and ducked behind a forklift just as the grenade exploded. A large explosion enveloped the Doomslayer but he burst forth from the smoke cloud, completely unharmed. This action did not go unnoticed by Eraserhead, Loud Cloud, and Mr. Brave who raced along on the warehouse rooftops. Did he just? Mr. Brave balked. Loud Cloud whistled as he rode his signature cloud. Miruko wasn't kidding, this guy really is a nut. Eraserhead silently stared at the vigilante as he and his comrades chased him. This was the man who recklessly endangered his students and literally disarmed Tamura Shigaraki. He took note of how he pulled out a grenade out of nowhere and deduced from watching the video camera footage from the Kiyashi Ward shopping mall that this man had some kind of storage quirk that allowed him to carry around his vast arsenal. Eraserhead looked ahead and saw the docks leading out into the ocean. By his guess, they only had minutes to stop him before he could jump off the pier. This guy's going to try to swim to I Island. He'll end up potentially jeopardizing everybody on that island so let's stop him in his tracks here and now. The other heroes are taking alternate routes to cut him off, I'll bind him and you two trip him up. He instructed. Mr. Brave nodded and Loud Cloud gave him a thumbs up. As the two heroes ran ahead, Eraserhead jumped off the roof and flung out his binding cloth at the vigilante which successfully wrapped around his neck, abdomen, arms, and legs. Whoa and the erasure hero was instantly dragged along the pavement as he held onto his cloth like a lifeline. The Doomslayer's strength easily ripped apart the binding cloth around his arms and legs like they were made of toilet paper, much to the surprise of eraser head. He gritted his teeth as he tightened his grip on the cloth that was still tied around the vigilante's neck and abdomen, he felt like he was being dragged around by all might. Mr. Brave and Loud Cloud landed on the ground ahead of the Slayer and rushed towards him. Mr. Brave pulled out strands of his hair to form a bat-like weapon while Loud Cloud twirled his signature bow staff. The duo charged forth with their weapons at the ready but they never got the chance to swing them at him when the Doomslayer suddenly grabbed them both by the sides of their heads and smashed them together. Normally their heads would have burst apart from the force but since the Slayer was holding back, they were immediately rendered unconscious and he chucked the both of them over his shoulder. Oboro. Aizawa shouted as he watched his friend tumble out of view. He could feel his back starting to burn from the friction of being dragged across the ground. It wouldn't be long before this lunatic road hauled him until he was nothing but a pelvis wearing a belt. Here I come, asshole. The slayer saw Maruko coming into view, a cocky grin on her face as she sprinted towards him. The slayer readied himself but for the first time in what seemed like eons, he faltered. This was not like him at all. He had no problem drop kicking these heroes out of his way but why was he showing hesitation towards this woman? Why was he acting like this all of a sudden? Why did he keep comparing her to Emily? Regardless of the reason, he wasn't going to let her stop him now, but he couldn't harm a hair on her head either. Miruko sprang up and swung her foot downward at the slayer but he caught her foot and flung her upwards into the air. Miruko's whole world was spinning before her eyes as she struggled to straighten herself in the air, only to have Hawk swoop in and scoop her up in his arms. You know, I vaguely recall having a dream like this once. 
Hawks cracked a smile with a light flush on his cheeks. It better not been a wet dream. Miruko warned. She looked downwards and was surprised to see just how high above the port they were. Just how hard did that guy throw her? Hawks flew downwards back to the port with Miruko still in his arms. So what do you know about Mr. Halo knockoff? You and Fatgum met him before, right? Hawks inquired his longtime friend. I only met him once. All I know is that he's crazy and has more guns than the expendables. Miruko answered as she tried to get the strands of her hair out of her face thanks to the wind. Well, by the looks of it, he's trying to make a break for I Island. Hawks assumed as he looked down at the port, noting that the vigilante had a clear path to the pier. What? Is he completely insane? Miruko gasped in confusion. If the sabers spot him they're gonna execute the hostages. It'll be a bloodbath. Don't sweat it, we'll stop him before he tries anything stupid. Hawks assured her as he flew over the warehouses. They came upon the still running vigilante with eraser head having wrapped several more strands of binding cloth all over the vigilante who now looked like a mummy slash robot hybrid. Slide and Go was quickly catching up while Midnight, Present Mike, Gang Orca, and Selkie trailed behind. Eraser had finally let go of his cloth when the friction burns became too much for him, tumbling away from the action when he did. You want me to swing you up front? Hawks offered as they neared the ongoing chase. Miruko carefully thought this over. That vigilante was insanely strong, enough to make her reconsider facing him head on again. However, when she was thrown, she could feel him holding back all of that strength. But why? She decided to think about it later when she noticed the strands of capture tape still wrapped around the vigilante. I got a better idea, set me down here and I'll try to slow him down. Hawks nodded and dropped Miruko who bounded off the roof of the warehouse and down to the ground. Dashing up next to Slyden, Go, she grabbed one strand of the tape while he grabbed another. Slyden, Go reversed his friction quirk to anchor himself while Maruko slammed both of her feet into the ground as they tightened their grips on the tape. At first, they thought it would slow the vigilante down but it didn't. He just kept on charging along without stopping or even slowing down. He was only picking up speed. Miruko gritted her teeth as tiny pieces of concrete flew into her face and she could feel the plates around her feet starting to wear down rapidly. Slide and Go wasn't faring any better either as his feet began to burn. Hawk swooped down at the vigilante to the left, clutching a sword made out of his feathers while Gran Torino zoomed in from the right ready to deliver a flying kick to the back of the vigilante's head. Crust then came into view from up ahead and held out his fists. Cease. He valiantly boomed as a massive wall made of white hexagonal patterns surged forth from his hands and formed a triple-layered, semicircle barrier to entrap the vigilante. Miruko smirked in relief knowing that this loon now had no way out and his little stunt would end there. Gran Torino's kick was mere seconds away from connecting with the slayer's head when he suddenly grabbed the aging hero's foot and threw him to the right. The force at which Gran Torino was flung sent him smashing face first into Crust's barrier, breaking the hero's nose and knocking him out like a light. Hawks shot towards the vigilante and thrust his sword at him but to his subsequent horror, it snapped like a twig against his armor. The Doomslayer grabbed Hawks by his neck, nearly cutting off his air circulation in an instant, and slammed him down face first into the pavement, breaking his goggles as he tossed him over his shoulder like a rolled up piece of paper. All of this was done while the Slayer was still running. He was nearing the front of the barrier and the Slayer, as if to give a middle finger to all the pro heroes presently chasing him, threw out his fist and demolished all three layers of Crust's reinforced shield wall in one blow. The shield hero, who was behind the barrier, was so gobsmacked that he had no time to defend himself or fight back when the vigilante snatched him by the scruff of his shirt and headbutted him square in the face, flinging him straight through the wall of a warehouse to his left afterward. The Doomslayer ripped off the rest of the capture tape just as he saw Fatgum charge toward him with an angry scowl. Closing the distance, Fatgum was about to engulf the vigilante within his rubbery belly when the Slayer drove his fist right into the hero's gut so hard that it completely bypassed all of his fat. Fatgum's eyes bugged out of his head as the wind was completely knocked out of his lungs and his world went completely black when the vigilante threw a devastating uppercut to his chin, rendering him unconscious. The Doomslayer continued his unrelenting charge, leaving behind the knocked-out lump of lard in the dust. 
he didn't think he would have to hold himself back like this. Then again, these were men and women just doing their jobs but they were not fit for this situation and it was up to him to put a stop to it before the Steel Sabres got what they wanted. If these pro-heroes got in his way then he wouldn't hesitate to remove them from his path, non-lethally of course. The Slayer was momentarily surprised for a brief second when he saw a silver-colored dragon wearing a dress soar downward from the sky and land on the ground, cracking the pavement. Ryukyu bared her dagger-like incisors and bounded right at him with a throaty growl. The Slayer, completely undeterred, continued to charge at her and he looked behind to see the other pro heroes starting to catch up to him with Maruko up at the front. Hatching an idea, he reached for his hammer space backpack which didn't go unnoticed. Eraserhead, who had just caught up, spotted the vigilante reaching towards his hip and knew what he was going to do. His pupils went bright red, his erasure quirk focusing hard to prevent the vigilante from. To his absolute shock, the vigilante pulled out a bazooka even though he was using his quirk on him. Eraserhead's jaw hung open. Not once, in his entire career as a pro hero, did he ever see anyone resistant to the nullifying effects of his quirk. He was so stunned that he almost tripped over his own feet. Instead of aiming his rocket launcher at Ryukyu, the Doomslayer aimed at his feet and pulled the trigger, the force of the explosion propelling him into the air and blowing back the heroes pursuing him. Ryukyu shielded herself with her wings and spotted the vigilante high above, the dragon heroine taking flight and shooting toward him like a missile. The Slayer swapped out his rocket launcher for his Gauss cannon, outfitted with the Siege Mode mod. But instead of aiming at her, he turned away and charged up his weapon while aiming at the sky. Ryukyu was almost upon him, ready to swat him out of the sky. A blast of light blue energy exploded out of the Gauss cannon and sailed harmlessly into the night sky and beyond. But the resulting kickback of such a powerful shot launched the Slayer towards Ryukyu with the speed of a bullet and slammed into her abdomen with the force of a train. Ryukyu coughed up blood as the pain of having her whole ribcage shattered coursed throughout her large frame. Leaping off the dragon heroine, the Doomslayer balled up his fist and punched her across the face, sending a fong flying out of her mouth and plummeting downwards. As the dragoness crashed into a stack of shipping containers, the Slayer landed back onto the ground and continued his sprint. He was nearing the docks and his objective was in sight, a small pier that would serve as the perfect jumping point. After that, he would be well on his way to I Island. But there was just one more obstacle in his path. Up ahead he could see a heavily muscled man wearing a dark blue bodysuit and armored gauntlets with his feet, chest and most of his face on fire stood imposingly with a hardened glare. He had an ugly sneer on his face like he viewed the Doomslayer with contempt. Vega provided him the info. Subject, Enji Tadurochi. Height, 6 feet 4 inches. Age, 45. Alias, Flame Hero Endeavor. Quirk, Hellflame allows him to produce and manipulate large amounts of extremely intense fire at will. Current rank, number 2 pro hero of Japan. Enough, villain. Endeavor thundered as raised his fist, now glowing red hot and covered in a rapidly growing fire that was beginning to encompass his whole arm. He suddenly thrust it into the pavement and glowing cracks began to form around the area, zipping up till they were underneath the Slayer. Hell Minefield. A jet of flame erupted from the earth and struck the Doomslayer point blank. Then the ground started to swell and a massive eruption of fire exploded underneath him, consuming nearly half the port in flames. Endeavor removed his fist from the ground and stared at the massive wall flames before him that almost stretched from one end of the port to the other. He saw no movement of any kind and figured that the villain had been taken care of. He folded his arms with a stoic yet satisfied demeanor. Though some would call this excessive force, he would say that it was necessary to prevent any unwanted interference in this operation. That man was a loose cannon. Vigilante, villain, it didn't matter. They were all the same and they deserved no quarter. The Doomslayer burst forth from the flame wall and swung a bone-crushing clothesline that caught Endeavor right in the neck. The flame hero let out a pained gargle as he hacked up blood, his eyes bugging open. The Slayer then clamped his hand around Endeavor's face and slammed him down into the concrete, the back of his skull nearly cracking in half. Leaving the brutalized hero behind, the Doomslayer continued unabated. That guy's quirk was called Hellflame. Fucking pathetic. The flames of hell were much hotter. 
He was now nearing the pier when he heard a loud, familiar voice cut through the sound of the still burning flames. You're not going anywhere, you bastard. Snapping his head around towards the flame wall behind him, he saw Maruko leap out of the flames and give chase. The slayer saw the burns she had on her skin as well as the singes around her hair and ears. Reckless idiot. Was she trying to get herself killed? He picked up the pace and was nearing the end of the pier but Maruko was already closing in. Luna Rocket. Maruko launched herself at the slayer in a flying dropkick. Seeing it coming, the doomslayer jumped up, turned around in the air, and braced his arms in front of him. Miruko's feet slammed against the vigilante's arms, unleashing a shockwave that knocked over several objects around them. Time seemed to slow down for Rumi. She could faintly see the vigilante's face behind his darkened visor and saw his eyes. The force of Miruko's attack launched the slayer away from her like a cannonball in an arc over the pier and fell towards the water. As soon as Maruko realized her grievous error, Hawk swooped in and created a burst of wind that extinguished a large portion of Endeavor's flame wall to allow the other pro heroes to get through. Despite the loss of his goggles and a broken nose, the wing hero was still determined to stop the vigilante and he unleashed a torrent of feathers at him so they could bind and carry him off to solid ground. Eraser Head, who was running alongside his fellow heroes, saw him reach towards his hip again. This time he focused all of his power into his quirk, under the belief that the last time had to have been a fluke. It had to be. But once again, in another soul-crushing blow to Eraser Head's composure, the Slayer pulled out another of one of his many weapons. This time it was the plasma gun and he had just enough time to swap it out for the heat blast mod which still had a full charge the last time he used it. With the feathers about to engulf him, the Doom Slayer pulled the trigger and a blast wave of pressurized heat emanated around him, vaporizing the feathers into ash. He finally hit the water and could feel himself beginning to quickly sink due to the weight of his Praetor suit. Luckily, Vega's previous instructions on modifying the jump boots helped him greatly. Upon activation, the Slayer easily glided through the water with very little resistance and headed north to where Island was located. Back on the surface, the remaining pro heroes who hadn't been punched into a coma gathered near the slightly charred Maruko and Hawks who just touched down. Shit. We're too late. Present Mike cursed. Don't worry. We got this. Gang Orca proclaimed as he took off his tie. The sea is our turf. Selkie added proudly as he slipped on his swimming goggles. The two aquatic heroes ran towards the end of the pier and jumped into the water, their quirks easily enabling them to torpedo themselves through the currents and give chase. On dry land, the other heroes anxiously watched the waters while Midnight, Slyden, Go, and Eraserhead tried to help Endeavor. This goes without saying, you need to stop throwing yourself into the meat grinder like this. Hawks reminded Maruko out of concern for her burn wounds. Don't sweat it. I felt worse. Maruko grinned, ignoring the burning pain on parts of her body. I'm just more concerned about what we do now. You think Orca and Selkie can handle him? Present Mike wondered. I mean, he just plowed right through us and thrashed Endeavor Dash. I said don't fucking touch me. Present Mike bristled as Hawks and Maruko looked behind him. Speaking of whom. The enraged number two hero threw Midnight, Slyden, Go, and Eraser head off of him when they attempted to help him. NG was absolutely infuriated at his humiliation. His pure, unadulterated rage towards the vigilante was unfathomable. He grounded his teeth as the blistering pain of his fractured skull threatened to make him pass out. His livid death glare was focused on the ocean, if Gang Orca and Selkie captured him, he was going to pay the vigilante back for this. In blood. Stepping away from the furious flame hero, Midnight glanced at Aizawa and noticed the shell-shocked, almost traumatized look he had in his eyes. Eraser head. Hey, what's wrong? My quirk, it, it didn't work on him. Everyone within an earshot heard him. Endeavor, Midnight, Present Mike, Hawks, Slyden, Go, and Maruko stared back at him with expressions of disbelief and confusion. Ah, uh, could you run that by us again? Slyden, Go requested shakily. Two geysers of water erupted out in the distance before Eraser Head could answer. Just as everyone looked out to the sea, two objects crash-landed right behind them. 
To their shock, it was the unconscious forms of Gang Orca and Selkie. The whale hero had most of his teeth knocked out while the seal hero had a massive fist imprint on the side of his face. As the pro heroes ran over to help them, Maruko was left to herself staring at the wreckage of the port before her. In the span of a few minutes, one man completely decimated several pro heroes single-handedly. It was so hard to believe that something like this happened. He didn't stay and fight, he just bulldozed through them like they were nothing. Didn't even stop, just kept on going until he finally escaped. Turning around to look at Eye Island, Maruko knew that he was now on his way over there. What was he going to do? What happened if the Steel Sabers started executing hostages because of him? She didn't want to know the answers to those questions but there was one thing on her mind, his eyes. Why did they look so reluctant? Reluctant towards her specifically. As Slyden Go looked over UQ, who had reverted to her human form, he turned towards Eye Island, and an evil-looking smile spread across his face. The undercover agent of the Meta Liberation Army stroked his chin in thought, sensing that this vigilante could be a promising new addition to Redestro's ranks. High above the scene on a crane, a figure had watched what had unfolded before her eyes. She was a tan-skinned woman with white hair, amber-colored eyes, and a rune imprinted on her forehead. Her ornately detailed armor was covered by a heavy brown cloak draped across her lithe frame. This woman was Uriel, the Archangel of Wisdom. Although she had wanted to step in and stop the legendary Doomslayer from killing them, she was legitimately surprised to witness that he had not taken a single life. It seems that he was solely focused on heading towards Eye Island to where the Steel Sabers had taken hostages. The Archangel of Wisdom felt powerless to do anything. The Prime Council was at a loss of what to do with the Slayer and the Ascendant Realm was in a state of unease and uncertainty, none of the gods knew what to do. What should be done? Would he disrupt the eternal balance? Will his actions force the four horsemen to intervene? Turning her gaze towards Eye Island, Uriel knew that the unchained predator would soon unleash his wrath upon the steel sabers. But was it to fuel his bloodlust or save the innocents? To be continued.